everyone. Thank you for coming out and for those of you who are live streaming. Um, I'm really excited about today and if you know me, um, refugee health is my passion. And I was actually here a couple months ago on the Latinx panel. And so I'm happy that Dr. Rodriguez let me come back to participate in this one as well. Um, and before I start, or let the panelists start, because I don't want to take away too much time from them, I wanted to go over some brief terms, as um, refugee kind of gets mixed in with immigrant and asylee, and there's a lot of confusion. And even for me, sometimes I can be confused trying to categorize um, just for resources um, for that kind of thing. So I'll begin. And, and then I will introduce the panelists, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so basic terms, um, refugee. So that is one who has had to flee their home country due to persecution or conflict or the fear of. Um, immigrant or migrant, that is one who moves to another country for reasons other than persecution or conflict. Asylum seeker is one who is seeking international protection due to persecution or conflict who then therefore becomes refugee. Um, displaced person, that is one seeking safety in other parts of their country. And um, these, they can get intermixed a lot, but it, it's helpful when you understand the basic terms due to the resources that are available in Utah and understanding what an individual has gone through to get here. Um, resettlement in Utah, so there are about 1,100,000 um, refugees that come in annually. Historically, um, the numbers have decreased um, due to government changes and things like that, but we are just taking advantage of giving more quality of care and attention to those who are resettled here. And Utah actually has about 65,000 refugees here, which you probably don't realize. That's a lot of people and a lot of um, different cultures that we can learn from. And there are two resettlement agencies in Utah. There is an International Rescue Committee, IRC. There is Catholic Community Services, CCS. And then there is one secondary migration um, agency, and that is Asian Association of Utah Refugee and Immigrant Center, also known as AAU. And they also work with state and community resources, like the Utah Refugee Services Office, that is within the Department of Workforce Services, which is also something that I think is interesting, as you think of DWS just um, for basic kind of things, but really they have a big part in helping the refugees in the settlement. And um, finally, um, the Utah Department of Health this morning gave me an updated chart that isn't yet online, um, showing the number of refugee arrivals between 1998 to 2018. And you can see how it fluctuates, and that is not only due to government, but crises um, globally. Depending on what is going on, that will fluctuate how many refugees that we get. And um, the Utah Department of Health said they don't expect more than 300 arrivals for 2019. So that will be the lowest amount in the refugee resettlement program in Utah since it began. But again, that we can look at it in a positive manner of having the time to really give them attention and help with their transition and become acquainted because who knows what could happen in the future. And then as, I, uh, as the panelists are going through, I will leave this up here. Um, this is the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugee. They, are, um, they have a huge part in resettlement from refugees coming over to different countries, not only the United States, and this just shows that less than 1% of the world's refugees are actually ever resettled, which is crazy to think about. And um, that there are over 22.5 million refugees worldwide. So I will just leave that up as eye candy because I find it really interesting. And then I will now introduce um, these panelists who I'm so <coughs> honored to have here. So we have Rayma, she is a medical interpreter as well as refugee community liaison. We have Kenan, which you're going to have to tell me your position because I know you keep... Yeah, no worries. Um, I'm currently a systems engineer at BioFire. Yes. And then we have Mahobo, who is a certified medical assistant at the Sugar House Clinic, who also was at Redwood, my home clinic. And we have Suavis, 
who is the refugee coordinator over at Salt Lake County um, Adult and Aging Services. And we have one more panelist coming, Leonard, and he is a refugee coordinator for Health Access Project, as well as um, he is opening the doors in Utah County for refugee resettlement. So mm -hmm. we're excited for mm -hmm. him to be here too. And I will go ahead and let you guys introduce yourself, um, maybe say where you are from, and anything like that would be useful for the audience to know. Sure. And the microphone is right there in the middle, but it should be able to hear you. Sure. Is this thing on? Oh. Okay. My bad. You want me to start? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My name is Suavis Kanyange. I am originally from Burundi. And as Anna just said, I am working with refugee senior for Salt Lake County. And I'm also a community leader. And I have been working for uh, workforce service and then I decided to go back to school. Um, I just graduated at the University of Utah. I did a master's in social work oh, and mental congratulations. health. Congratulations. Thank you. So, so um, I don't know what else can I say, uh, but as I was working with um, DWS, I decided to go to school because I was thinking if I become a social worker, probably I would be more helpful for my community first, because Burundi um, is a country where we have refugees who came 10 years ago, <laughs> but, um, sorry, let me see. Mm -hmm. So, um, they came t 10 years ago, and 99% uh, of my community members, they never been to school at all, and as you know, just uh, even if you are, you know you are educated just to navigate this system is very challenging so can you imagine when you never been to school when you know you don't know even abc is very hard so that is why i accepted the invitation just to come to uh, as an advocate uh, just to share with you and see how we can really meet refugee need thanks Me? <coughs> All right, I'll go next. <laughs> Sorry, everybody, my name is Kenan, um, as Anna said. Um, I am a, um, a refugee from Bosnia. Uh, we uh, immigrated, I guess, here back in 2000, um, and we've been living in Salt Lake ever since then. So um, let's see, what else? In terms of educational background, um, I studied here at the U. I was actually in Anna's cohort um, at Leap Health Sciences for about four years, so I know her very well. Um, yeah, it was great. Um, and uh, I kind of got interested in the, the healthcare industry. Uh, totally thought I was going to go the doctor route, did all my like, pre-med uh, pre recs and all that kind of stuff, and then I decided, you know, uh, it's not for me right now. So I decided to go and look into the engineering side of things. And um, right now I'm working, like I said, at BioFire, um, who is a biomedical company, um, and doing some engineering stuff there. Um, other than that, I recently uh, got my MBA as well. So that's that's taken care of and um, kind of going from there. So that's me. Let's try to skip away from <laughs> <laughs> um, My name is Mohobo. I am really happy to be here. Thanks, Anna, for inviting me over. Um, I'm a refugee from um, small camp in it's called Kakuma. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Um, I came here in 2007 as a refugee, and I started going to high school. Started off of high school <laughs> and had to cover my um, 11th, 10th grade, and 9th grade, and everything in just two years time frame I had. And I worked for all the community, all the companies that she mentioned, CCS, AAU, IRC, as interpreters. Um, and then I started working at the Redwood Health Center as a medical assistant, also as an interpreter, which I really <laughs> loved. <laughs> I worked in an advocate and almost everything. <laughs> and that gave me the permission to work with Anna for the last six years. And um, Right now, I'm also in school doing my prereqs for the midwifery program. 
I was not interested in that, but... <laughs> get it, get it. Well, mainly you go in that is just for my patients, my communities that do not want to see a male doctor. And I'm like, I think this is what I can do. Mm. So, you know, help a huge percentage of that. <laughs> um, I think that's about it for now. Okay. My name is Rima Kayali and I've been working with the refugee community for over 10 years. I originally am Palestinian. Um, my family sought refuge and went to Jordan, and then we came from Jordan to the U.S. Um, I've been here almost 11 years, the last time I came. I've been working um, as a medical interpreter paid, and. Uh, with nonprofits, one I helped open, um, empowering women and victims of domestic violence, empowering women to become leaders, not in a very positive way, um, and helping refugees integrate into American society in the healthiest way possible. And that's about it. Okay. <laughs> I also work with AAU and all the CCS and yeah. all letters. So it's really neat how um, the, these former refugees, they get intertwined still with their community and want to give back and improve Salt Lake. And I find it really, really um, a privilege and inspiring when working with them. So I will start with the questions. Okay. And um, if each of you want to take a couple minutes answering. Oh, well, it looks like our next panelist is here as well. Great. Right on time. Perfect timing, Leonard. Hi. Come have a seat. Got the hot seat. <laughs> Thank you. So everyone just introduced themselves, Leonard, and um, talks about what they are doing. <coughs> Go ahead and take it for my friend. Okay. Well, uh, my name is Leonard Bagalwa, and uh, I work with a company called Health Access Project that helps refugees uh, to get access um, on a medical need. Um, and uh, also, I also work with another organization called Utah Community and Refugee Partnership Center in Provo as well, to help refugees as well. So, yes. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, Lara, I'm going to start with the questions, and you can just take a couple minutes and um, share your thoughts. So as a patient, what do you look for when seeking health care services? <coughs> Pretty broad question. <coughs> Just any of us can shout out? Yeah, go for it. Are you doing this or? <laughs> well, um, yeah, go for it. So uh, when I'm looking for um, uh, like health care, um, first of all, I need somebody who understands my my culture and my need. So that's number one thing I will be looking to because um, if you understand my culture, it's easy to uh, help me and uh, that will open the door to, um, uh, to knowing more about me. But when you don't understand my culture, it kind of pushes me away. And uh, once it pushes me away, then it will be, I will be a little bit close and um, uh, you, I might not get much help as I need. So I'm talking um, personally, and also those are the type of things I've seen with most refugees. And uh, so the other things I will need is also, of course, um, I will need a doctor who's going to give me time. And somebody who's going to give me time like to uh, make, diagnose me and um, make sure that um, they understand all my needs and instead of like just 15 minutes come and go, stuff like that. Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. For me, um, working for the past 10 years as a medical interpreter um, with providers, and I am a big fan of the University of Utah Healthcare. I think it's one of the best in the world. And I think the most important thing for me as a patient or an advocate would be care. When you go in and you're sick, you find that your provider 
treats you with compassion, respect, and most importantly, has the time to know um, what medicines you're on and um, your health needs. And that's it. And health history. <laughs> that's very important. Perfect. So I'm going to echo what these two just said. However, I want to kind of approach this from a different perspective. As someone who's grown up here since the age of seven, I've become indoctrinated, assimilated into the American culture and the lifestyle. So when I go to seek health care, it's not much different from what you go, when you go, right? Um, but I also have the privilege of taking my mother, who is still very much kind of, you know, holding on to a lot of our cultural values and things like that. Not so that I'm not, but just in a different way, right? Um, and I take her a lot to, um, in fact, the Redwood Health Center. She's been with Dr. K for the past 18 years. That's been her primary, and she's been, a, you know, a long-time patient of his. And um, to this day, kind of, one of the one of her biggest needs um, that more or less is still unfulfilled is just having someone who understands that cultural background and how we can how they can relate. Um, and one big reason that she ended up choosing to go to the Redwood Health Clinic is just because there there was a a, diver, a diverse pool of doctors available uh, for her to go ahead and and interact with. Um, and a quick anecdote on that. Uh, she had some issues uh, when we first came here, and we went. We were referred to a facility, and I don't know exactly where. And they didn't. It wasn't a misdiagnosis, but they couldn't really provide us what what, the, what they were looking for. And a friend of my mother's, who I actually ended up do, who was doing medical interpreting, uh, referred us to Dr. K and uh, at Redwood. And since then, my mom just kind of recognized something in him. He is a he is a doctor. Um, I want to say of Indian descent, Pakistani descent. I can't remember. I don't know what, what, is, what his lineage is, but is he? Is he? Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he, um, he is of, uh, of, of some type of some descent, and I think what she saw there was someone who had some cultural background where she can relate to him, and he can relate to her. The other thing is, she was looking for someone who's going to be competent and know what they were doing, and the previous medical professional that she, that she saw was just kind of, they were just kind of like, oh, it'll go away. And then when she went to him, she actually received a formal diagnosis, some treatment plans, and someone she felt like he was competent and could actually follow up with her and give her what she needed. Um, so that's that's been one of the one of the biggest factors. Um, I too have done medical interpretation. I've taken patients, many Bosnian patients, to different places, different clinics, hospitals. I mean, I've sat through many in ER and. Um, a common theme, again, is just like, okay, do you understand kind of this patient's background? Um, and uh, a lot of times what I end up doing is having to explain like, hey, in our culture, this is X, Y, and Z, and this is maybe why we've, we've arrived at this health outcome right now, and this is what you're having to treat. So if you're aware of that, this is going to be a lot easier um, going forward. And I'll think of some more examples as I, as I sit here, but that's, that's what I've got to share. Um, um, as a patient, I think I've been a patient um, at the university. The University of Utah, like she said, I really love the company. Um, it's a great place to work for and to, you know, be a patient of. Um, when I go to healthcare, what I seek is the best care that they can provide, I mean, which they're already doing. Um, but for refugees, I think um, what they're seeking more when you're not from here is time. I don't think we do 20, 40 minute visits for patients, but I think for refugees, they need longer than that. None of the refugee patients' um, health care or problems is acute. So anything that they come up with is a chronic pain that they've been dealing with, um, no matter where they were in the camps before they get here, mm -hmm. they um, got exposed to a lot of things, got injured and all that. So when they come to the facility, it's 15 minute time frame with an interpreter. It's just, it doesn't meet the care they need. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are trying, the university is trying, but what I seek or I would like to, you know, get is a time if I were um, in their shoes. And um, like I said, their problem is very chronic. No matter what they present, it's not something that has started the last week, month, or even a year. It can be the last 10 years, and we cannot um, answer all the questions and give them what they want in a 15-minute time frame. 
Um, I think that's it for me. Uh, adding to what they just say, I think it's the, everything they just mentioned is really like true. Just, uh, you know, having enough time and having someone who understands you. But I want just to highlight something which is very, very important. And I hope that uh, all medical providers, health providers will really know that thing is the language. I myself, I speak a couple languages. Um, and, but I can tell you with maybe my education, I can tell that I, am, I can be really a good interpreter in terms of languages. Because, to, you know, interpretation, maybe they know more than me, uh, you know, is very hard. It's very hard, it's very hard to find that terminology just to explain what that patient really needs how they feel is very hard. And what I saw mainly as I am, you know, serving my community who don't speak English at all, who don't know even ABC, who don't know how to spell their name, I saw many really challenging, you know, when they meet with medical doctor. Or they have interpreter who obviously, who is doing everything they can to interpret what the <laughs> patient say but it's not enough and i can guarantee you there is always something missing if for example he she become a doctor and she treat person who speak her language the treatment would, would take another direction than to be to have the interpreter mm -hmm. you know between so i know inter interpreters they do everything they can but the translation service is really a problem if we really need to advocate for our, our patient. I know we can't have a doctor who speak our languages, and a refugee will have 10,000 languages you speak. It's really hard, but I think it is something we have, you know, missing when we put interpreter in between. So another thing I want to say uh, is some medical doctor, they don't take it serious I think the refugee, uh, in, uh, what I want to say, I know many people who, many, you know, uh, doctor office, they don't provide interpreter. So because uh, maybe there's no funding to pay interpreter, but I saw many people who in the neighborhood, they go to the doctor, but they don't provide, they don't pay interpreter for those patients who really, you know, be served. So that is what I was all the time, uh, you know, thinking maybe, I know it's not something we can't fix, but if we can really, if we are taking a new patient to ask them which language do you speak, where do you come from, uh, just to cover the culture piece they just mentioned, and then to say, okay, when you call our office, you know, we're going to have an interpreter for you or even on the phone. And there's some doctors, they don't really, in the rest of Utah, they are doing very well, they, are, mm -hmm. they have interpreter all the time, but all the medical providers, they don't, especially in, in our community, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's really very, very big challenging, and the, the refugees are really left. To fend for themselves. Yeah, yeah. so, and thank you. Um, I would give, uh, of what has been said here, we're talking about <coughs> culture and language here. Um, so I would give you, I do case management, and I will tell you one example. No names, machine here. So uh, I was helping this lady uh, who needed a dental. Uh, and, and then she, uh, we did the, I did the appointment and she went to see the doctor. So when she went to the doctor's office, number one thing she was, well, this was true interpretation. Number one thing is just have a seat over there. So they sit down. Number two, lay down. Number three, open the mouth. So open your mouth. And then what came up was the, the lady, she just ran away. Because that brought the memory of what happened to her. Okay, what happened to her? She was abused. And she didn't say anything, she ran away. And then the next thing sir, I received, I received a call from, uh, from a doctor and said, oh, we don't know what happened. I'm like, okay, I haven't heard from her. I called the patient and called the patient. He's like, 
The patient asked me, I said, Leonard, I did trust you. I thought you were my caseworker. How can you send me to the rapist? Okay? And in my mind, I was like, oh, I felt I was supposed to tell the doctor, to communicate to the doctor that this is what happened and to be careful. However, the doctor also was supposed to deal with it a different way. So that's where the time and culture comes from. Because when you take the time to know about the patient, uh, it will help know how to treat that patient. You will know those things uh, in advance and you can know what type of uh, proper care you're going to give the patient. So that's like the problem uh, most refugees are, uh, are facing. Yeah. So. Yes, that is another thing. Um, refugees have been through a lot, um, hence why fleeing from their country due to persecution or fear of that can range from any kind of violence or abuse or torture. And that's true. It can be brought up again if there's not time given to explain why you're doing something to make that patient feel comfortable. I'm so glad that you guys brought that up. Um, that's not something I think is very commonly talked about because it is sensitive. And I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, jumping ahead a little bit, what are barriers that you or family members have faced when trying to seek help, health care? Well, as we all know, um, the healthcare uh, system um, is broad, everything is broad here. Um, I will talk a much on behalf of the people I, I work with. Is, uh, the most barriers, we already said language, culture, and then also uh, the other things it will be, um, the, the system is too big, so people do not understand what's really going on. People are confused. <coughs> and, uh, um, and I do believe for among those who were born here, there's still some people who are still confused, who don't understand what's really going on with the healthcare. So those are all the barriers. So education uh, is needed all over there as well. And uh, as a case manager, that's where the most place I take my time to uh, explain uh, the patient of what they are going to, to go through and stuff like that. But um, not all patients will understand that because me to still have the same barrier of them with the with the, the language as well. So I think as health providers we all have uh, the responsibility of uh, knowing that there is this barrier around and we have to all kind of uh, work help each other. But the barrier is a big uh, is, is a lot to, to talk about. So it's not yeah. a time. Yeah. It's a big question. Yeah, it's a big question. Yeah, it is a big question. For me, I think um, the major issue I've seen is high cost of care for the uninsured who fall through the gap where they work but don't make enough money, don't qualify for insurance. This is a huge thing that is happening um, for people who work very hard. They don't qualify for Medicaid, they don't qualify for Obamacare. So they kind of fall through the gap and become sick. And a major, major concern of mine for the refugees and for people in general is there isn't enough dental coverage uh, or any dental coverage. And you all know that that is very important because through our mouth we can get heart problems, many very serious illnesses that I've seen like a young man um, who's a refugee from Iraq. Um, he's 24 years old, has heart condition now because he didn't receive um, the appropriate care for his um, um, teeth. So for me that would be the biggest, biggest issue. A lot of people are falling through the gap, refugees and <coughs> others. So speaking from past experience, um, I've been, I, I would say the, the major barrier that we, I've encountered as I've kind of taken my mom through the system um, has been language. I've been interpreting for my mother since age seven before I knew how to translate most of these terms. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's honestly, that's not as, as rare as you think. Um, many immigrant families, they depend on these children to go ahead and interpret for them. Mm -hmm. And how do you, how do you uh, translate the word like clot or 
anaphylaxis, right? Um, as a seven-year-old in your native language, which you just barely learned, but then you left the country, and I mean, you just barely learned your native language, and then you, you left your country, and now you gotta learn how to read, write, and spell in your new language. You don't know what the word of anaphylaxis is to begin with. How do you translate it, right? That th those are the those are the uh, the issues that I that I faced growing up and kind of help ha having to take my mom through the healthcare system, um, and we also encountered at s at some point um, problems with access to care in terms of insurance, non insurance, things of that nature, um, and that was encountered mainly when. Um, we no longer qualified for state Medicaid and things like that because we did get that when we first came. Um, then I was, thankfully, I was you know young enough that I can I was qualified under CHIP for a long time, so I could I could stay covered. But my mom wasn't so lucky, so a um, couple of her conditions that we didn't even know she had went untreated for a while until she was able to find an employer that would offer her health insurance and things of that nature. So I would say. The biggest one that we've had is language and kind of a and accessing care and kind of the, the the money component of it as well, um, and just kind of trying to figure out how to how to go from there. Currently, the biggest one that we're facing is um, what, what was said earlier, just kind of time. Like, can, does your provider give you enough time to explain it for everything? And what I wanted to echo earlier was like, I when when I take my mom, even to this day, I still take her to her appointments. I go specifically, even though the U offers interpreter services, I could easily just say, mom, call them up, make an appointment, interpreter will meet you there, blah, blah, blah. But that interpreter does not know her history, does not know the, you know, all, all the culture and the background, that kind of stuff. Even though they might be from the same place, they don't know my mom and the, her conditions and things like that. So I take her because I can summarize her health history and her background, all the, I know every surgery she's had, I know all the pills she's on, I, you know, I've got all that. Um, and I can summarize that to the doctor within five minutes and make the most of those 10 minutes that we have available for him to actually, or her to treat um, whatever condition we're there for. So, so sorry to jump in. Yeah. Um, the, on uh, in health insurance, so, and the other mistake is happening, especially with the billing department, is, is that mm -hmm. all refugees call everything Medicaid. And, and when yep. you go to the doctor's <laughs> office, even if they're already like uh, on ACA or so any other insurance, private insurance, Medicaid. they still want to uh, just tell the doctor Medicaid. And then they will run in the system and they will see, oh, they have had Medicaid before. And they're going to build that Medicaid. And, and then the people will receive the bill and they're going to sit on the bill until they go to the collection. It's another huge deal we are dealing with yeah. right now. So, so it's good if there's time. To if they give them time, you can ask. Do you have Medicaid? Have you ever have ACA? Have you ever, you know those type of things? So everything goes back to the time. Yeah. Time to know the person. So to this like day, that. my mother, 18 years in, still calls her employer-sponsored insurance Medicaid, yeah. and so I make sure to check in for her every single time and say, no, 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 here's the card. It's Cigna or whatever we've got, right? Yeah. Um, because it, it it will be built incorrectly. Yes. So. I think all of us share the same thing, so <laughs> all the answers have been covered before it gets to me. Um, I think the biggest barrier is, um, for me, the language. Like he said, I have never let my parents um, went to the doctor's office, the housing authority, the Department of Workforce Services, uh, whatever they have to deal with all alone. I'll always make sure I'm there. Um, I do the scheduling and everything so that it works with my school and work. Um, and the reason why I do that is, again, I know everything that's going on with them and I have been there since we got here um, with them and I know the process, um, everything. And the reason why I did that was when I was <laughs> little, I couldn't interpret some of the language they um, used, uh, language line services for my mom in which nothing was transferred right to my mom or the providers and all that. And um, it was a big, big barrier that I said, okay, from now on, I'll go with you wherever we have to go. It's going to be us. Um, and then the other biggest thing is the Medicaid. Some patients don't even show up to um, their appointments because they don't, they think the card is not working, but even though we renew it every month, so they get ex letter says hey call to do this this is your new card they're like oh i don't have medicaid anymore i'm not going um and then the other thing is um schedule an appointment refugees appointments are scheduled through um 
case managers. So the patients have no idea that they have an appointment if the case manager don't show up to their house. And then that, and then if the um, case manager don't come to my house, I will not go to the appointment because I have no idea I have one. And the next time he will reschedule one and he forgets it. And then the third time something else happens, guess what? Now I got dismissed from the healthcare services. Totally not my fault. Because first I had no idea, second I had no idea, third I, I had no idea. So I think for um, uh, refugee patients should not have um, uh, uh, dismission letters. That's one big thing that we need to take out of our university system because even if they're being dismissed, they don't know that they are dismissed because the letter they cannot read and now they will go and show up to the appointment. And then the other thing is um, if their child is dismissed because they didn't show up to the um, um, health center three times, it's not the child's fault. So they dismiss this kid, but your other three kids can come here. And but this other kid, you have to take him to St. Mark's. So that's, that's a big thing. Um, the people that are here knows how to speak English. I mean, for me, I don't mind. I can get that. But for refugees that English is their second language. English is my third language. I speak two other languages. So refugees, Eng um, um, English is not their first language. It's not their second language. It's not their third language or fourth because they have to come from their uh, home, come somewhere else, which is a different country, and then flee from there, go here. So they're learning all these languages that English will be the fourth or the fifth. So, so you talk? We have a winner. So um, I think a dismission letter or a no-show letter should not be an option for a fourth language speaking. Yeah, I, I am really happy that I come here and I can hear what you are saying, guys. Uh, I just want, I don't want to repeat what they say, but I want to say something which is coming in my mind. And it's, it's bothering me. I, I am telling myself, I have to say this. I have to say this, no matter what. So. Adding to everything that they just say, obviously, can you imagine as a family, you know, the entire family who not only they don't speak English, but they don't know even how to read their own language. And what I want just to add on everything they say is many people, they don't have a case manager. Uh, what is going on with this system, they will say, once you are here from the day one you come, you will be helped by IRC or CCS. After two years, they will let you go. They will say, oh, you graduated, go by yourself. And uh, after two years, if you are lucky, you can have, depending on you know, some issue you have been you know, having, if you are lucky, you can have someone probably from you know, University of Utah who can be like, in, like Anna who can be also your case manager who can call you and say you have a doctor appointment today. But the population myself, I am helping senior and also the Burundi community member. Many of them, they will get those letters, including DWS letter, and they don't know what is in, inside. Some people, they throw them away. My senior, they have been throwing away the new Medicare card. Because as, uh, as uh, Leonard mentioned, they call everything Medicaid. And they, you know Medicaid it has a color, and the Medicare card has another color. So when they get that, those card, they will throw them away. They don't know what it is, or they will call it just, you know. So they, they really have, you know, issue to say, we read what is written in this letter, we are going to do appointment, or this is my medic, you know, Medicare. The, they don't know that health you can help better than select health. They don't know those differences. And another thing I want to mention, which was bothering me before, is we, even if we don't want to admit it, there is, there is still discrimination around. I remember myself, I went with one of my clients to the doctor's office somewhere in West Valley, and we sat there on the reception uh, the appointment was 11, we sat there until 12. 
And I was there as a case manager, and they, they call us, they say, are you the interpreter? I say, no, I am not the interpreter. Do you have, can you provide interpreter for the, this client? They say, no, we can't. So I say, okay, I can do it. And when we enter in the doctor office, obviously, he say hi, and he say, what can we help you with? But the face was really like that, you know, sweet face and, and the patient asked me, what is this doctor I look like he's a terrorist? <laughs> what is going on with him? Why he is sad? Why these people, they call them white people, they call them Muzungu. This Muzungu is really, he look like he's a, that soldier, you know, we had the experience of military, you know, persecution, and he said, he look like he's a terrorist. And what I want to say is not discrimination, but it yes, is a it kind is. of, when you see yes. a person who look different than you, 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 you don't really, I think, think that person is a human being. Let's smile, let's say hi, let's ask them how to say good morning in Swahili or in Kirundi or in another language, just to know that word. If you know the patient is from Bosnia, learn that word, how to say, have it in your office, how to say, good morning in the Bosnia language, and then when they come, they can feel they are welcome. And what, why I'm saying that, I am dealing with that in even senior center. When I say, I send refugee senior to go to senior center, they will go and the senior center staff and the other participants, they don't work, no, they don't, I don't want to generalize, but some of them, they don't welcome them. The refugee, they will go, they will sit on a chair by themselves, and they go, they eat by themselves, they go home, no one say hi. And those seniors, they will call me and say, Swavis, we don't want to go back there. So what I do, I go there, I call, you know, staff, I say, please, this refugee is from this way, is, is, is speak or she speak this language, and I beg staff to welcome them. Because as they say, Having a person feel comfortable with you, it will help you to treat these people, it will help you to create a relationship as a doctor, so those people, they can feel safe, so we avoid them to run away, like the client Elena mentioned. Just to tell them you are welcome, nice to see you today. And one, Thank you for coming. The only thing about that is, is, is not that we are whining or we are advocating for, for refugees only, mm -hmm. is in the professional world, the reality is, uh, even if you have bias, you have to leave that outside. You need to come uh, as a professional person and help the person, like them or not. And that's what I think the message we're trying to pass is that um, in the professional world, just help much everyone as you can uh, uh, to uh, your knowledge. Because uh, we, it's not that, it's not that uh, we here in America are the only people who are supposed to learn how to take care of this uh, other people, but it's about creating an environment where everyone gonna gonna <coughs> just uh, be sat satisfied, and I think that's the message we're trying to send is is uh, it, just to be professional, be open-minded. So we can talk about uh, we know everybody can be biased against anything, but when you are in your in your professional world, just to be professional as you are. Yeah, unfortunately that's not the case in many cases, but. Our message today is just uh, make professional, make other people comfortable. Sorry to cut you off. I would like to add something to that. My experience um, is happily a lot more positive than what you two have seen. I've seen great care and respect from the providers and um, society in general and support to the refugees. What I've seen was so rewarding working um, through the nonprofit, the generosity, the kindness, um, the respect from doctors at the U, Children's Center, JCC, um, a lot of places that supported financially, emotionally. I've, I am really blown away. It gave me hope and humanity. That was my experience, and I hope that you start seeing that. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to, to answer to what you said. Obviously what you say is true. Mm -hmm. 
even me because I speak English, I can come. I can ask my doctor. Doctor, is everything fine for me? So and then my doctor is really wonderful. I never had that experience, but I just want to mention is I don't know. I don't know, want to say it in a bad way, but. If I go, you and I, we go outside, you are walking outside here on the street, believe me or not, people, they will treat us differently. Mm -hmm. Maybe because you have a blonde hair, I have a black hair, I have a black skin. Some people, they can treat you differently mm -hmm. because you are mm -hmm. white, right, male, you know. Right. If you don't speak and you show, you know, your you have a night saint, for example, they can say, oh, this one is not from here. If they meet you on the road, they will say, hey, definitely, you are from America. But myself, mm -hmm. I can speak better English as you know I can. People sit away looking at my face. They can see I'm not American, you know. Mm -hmm. And that happened even in school. When my kids who were born in America who don't even have an accent like me, mm -hmm. They are some some teacher. They ask me, "Is your son in DSL?" I say, "No, my son doesn't need DSL. Mm -hmm. He speaks very good English." Because they see you as you know your teacher, they set away put you in one box, okay? And that box is what I want to mention. Not because I want to accuse anyone, but people, even elderly population, they can really see that you don't welcome them or you welcome them. Depending how you open the door, how you greet them, it, that will make the difference. Even if you say hi, where do you come from, which language do you speak, before you ask a question, where, where is your pen, how, you know, just to make them like, feel like they are wanted. That is what, not because, you know, uh, everyone is different, but myself, some people, you know, I said, they, they tell me, you know, they, because I speak their language, they trust me as a community leader or some as a case manager, they will tell me how they feel when they come out of your office. They will say, this person really doesn't care about me. This person doesn't, you know. So they can feel that way. It's just what we want you to be aware. Just to welcome them. You can't fix every problem, but to treat them as human beings. Even if you don't beat them, but just welcome them mm -hmm. is what I want to mention. Okay. Okay. So really, this panel needs to be at like three hours long. Right. Five years. <laughs> Refugee health is so dynamic and complex because I mean it's it's global. It's everybody is from everywhere, and it, it's right. really incredible. And um, it's one o'clock now, but I'd like to open the floor up to uh, Q and A for Please. those in the audience who had any questions. So we can keep on going. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Rodriguez. So thank you all for being here. We are delighted. And <coughs> we recognize that some of you have obligations that you have to leave at one. So if you've got to leave, just go ahead. One of the things that I loved hearing from you <coughs> is about the um, is about the real survivorship that has gone on in our refugee population, right? Because you've come from places that were really hard places to be, and you've been able to make a wonderful life, or a better life here. And one of the things that I would like to say on behalf of those of us that are here is, and I know you've been here a long time, but we're delighted that you're part of this community. And we would be less if you weren't here. And one of the things that I try to tell my patients when they come see me is, thank you for being here. You are an important part of our community. It's hard, because I have to say it through interpreters, but I've learned how to say thank you, not hello, but thank you in 23 different languages for that. And actually, I think we have a few of those languages represented at the table. <laughs> but really, we're delighted that you're part of our community. You add so much. And the work that you are doing with people who are newer than you is, oh, it's priceless and really important work to help us to do out. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. I was just wondering if for refugees there is some sort of um, mental health programs that help them process all the trauma that they carry so they can actually have a better chance to start a new life. Yeah. 
What is it? Um, I think mental health. health, it's the biggest health Terrible. barrier um, the refugee is going through. <clears throat> Um, there's a lot of mental health providers, I think, at the Redwood Health Center. Um, yeah, Redwood is the best. I mean, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's in the best the uh, location. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's why I applied for the first time. I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to learn how to become a medical assistant and work at the Redwood. And it just happened just like that perfectly. Um, the biggest, the health, the, one thing I've experienced is they don't, refugees do not like to be called you, mental health, like they don't mm -hmm. want to hear, hey, you need to see a mental health, what's, what's that, um, provider that's going to talk to you about uh, depression and anxiety and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and they're like, no, no, I don't want to mm -hmm. talk about that, no, I'm not going to see this provider, mm -hmm. why, are you calling me, I'm crazy, no, no, we're just trying to meet the best care for you. So I think the Asian Association of Utah has um, a great mental health providers, and that's where I would like them to be referred if you guys have patients, and that's what we do. We have mental health. Um, there's also this other center I really forgot. But Utah. A, yeah. Yes. Utah. Utah. Utah Health, health Human Rights. Human health Human, human rights. rights, yeah. Some of them will not go if you really do not explain the reason why they need to go to mental health. Um, they feel insulted if you tell them something's wrong with your brain. It's really not. I mean, I would go. It's because I went to school and learned some stuff. But yeah, I think that's a great point you bring, is the educating the yeah, refugees. Yeah, we need to educate them first. And I've been before. doing that, and I've been very successful um, educating the refugees. It's not black or white. You're not crazy or sane. Uh -huh, yeah, you know, everybody has some kind of a mental have. issue. Yeah, it's that's not true. even an illness; it's an issue. Mm -hmm. And I've had a very like ninety nine point nine success rate, f even with men mm -hmm. from Iraq, <laughs> the Middle East, and those, yeah. they are stubborn. Yeah, they will not. Where they are going, <laughs> <laughs> and they are getting the mental health because it all comes back to mental health. Everything that the refugees are feeling goes back to um, mental health. And right now we're working on a visualization and mindfulness class um, that I'm planning yoga. I have the refugees, men and women, for chronic pain doing yoga um, with Sacred Circle Healthcare. I work with them also. They have a very, very good mental health and wraparound system meaning the, the primary care, the mental health, the physical therapist, the addiction, or um, all of them are on one team. And they work together. And this is very, very, very crucial. And I don't see that at the U as much. I don't know where everything's on one page, the history. the So yeah, all goes back to mental health and dental. Sure. My uh, experience uh, with mental health is that um, there's also the, 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 the procedure also, also is another issue uh, because most, we have a behavioral um, uh, casework at Health Access Project from Intermount. So, and any person who have sent over there, they all come back complaining about this time consuming because it's not something that just mm -hmm. gonna come and do and go back, you know. So that's the other issue, that's the another barrier with uh, refugees, because they don't have the time, they have million things to do to survive. Learning English, uh, work and all those type of things. And, you know, some of them don't have a, bar, a, a, a car, they have to take buses, you know, time consuming. So that's another barrier also into the, the type of mental health issue as well. So, and nobody knows the answer to that one. But there is a there is a, another other side of what they mentioned. I think the, the, it, we, 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 if we talk about mental health, we have to talk about the culture also. Not only they don't want to be called crazy, as she mentioned, but there is a this Western culture. You know the model of therapy one to one. Some refugee it doesn't work one to one. They mentioned some uh, mental health provider, you know, facility. 
they forget to mention another facility which they don't therapy, they don't do therapy, as we can call. They do another kind of therapy which is really great, which is working more, is IRC. They have a new root program where they have gardening, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and the gardening when those refugees who are really have uh, you know PTSD, who have really different you know trauma, when they garden, they talk. They talk among them, they interact. So those programs are programs which I think are very successful in terms of helping those refugees mm -hmm. for their mental health than, you know, aging association. Aging association is really good, but I know people, I myself referred there, I went with them. When they sit with a therapist in one room, they will ask themselves, why am I here? In fact, I, I, it happened, I, I did my internship at the Asian Association, and you know, they refer them from, um, from um, health department when they do RHS 15 score. So they do RHS 15 score, they send them there, they use interpreter, obviously, and they, at that time I had a chance to do RHS 15 using the language, you know, and the score was different. So, and then when you ask them, why are you here? They say, why? And the people that will ask the question, no, a therapist will ask the question, and the refugee will say, what she want to, to, for me to say? Mm -hmm. So they will respond, they give you answer, you, you know, what you, you want to hear, hear. you want yeah. to hear. Yes. Or are you sleeping very well? Yes, I'm sleeping, you know. And uh, when I take them back in my car, I ask them, really, are you sleeping? I say, no, I'm, I'm sleeping two hours, but I have been sleeping two hours all my life. They are not going to change anything. I am happy, well, you know, as I am. But they tell me after. They will say, yeah. But they will say, yeah, we are sleeping. We are okay. We are perfect. So yeah, I'm that's sorry. That's part of building that trust. And, um, <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to cut it off, guys. Okay, thank but you. thank you so much for coming out. And thank you guys yeah. so much. It was really an honor to have you here. Yeah. Sure. Yeah.